Welcome to the One Minute Preceptor Podcast, your resource for clinical rotation advice and tips to prepare for your externships in healthcare. Learn how to earn letters of recommendation, prepare for your clerkship, and excel at patient care from preceptors with years of practice. We interview physician educators in every specialty and clinical setting to discuss how to prepare for your rotation and improve your clinical experience. Here's your host and MedEd entrepreneur, Chase DeMarco. We are joined today by Dr. Kenneth Fisher, who was a practicing nephrologist for 31 years, is author of multiple books related to healthcare, including most recently, Understanding Healthcare, A Historic Perspective, and is co-founder of the Michigan Free Market Medical Association. Kenneth, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine. How are you doing, Chase? Oh, pretty good. I'm hanging in there so far. (laughs) We'll see how this goes if you're still smiling. (laughs) Yeah, let's hope so. So I like to start this off now with a good icebreaker question. So what is either the funniest or the scariest thing that's ever happened to you or that you've ever seen in a hospital setting? Well, I thought I'd do something a little different. Before I I start rounds, my last job was as the director of the nephrology of fellowship program at Henry Ford Hospital. I'd start rounds with a joke, believe it or not. All right. (laughs) You got a joke for us then? I certainly do. It's a one-liner. One plastic surgeon said to another, my daughter gets her good looks from me. (laughs) All right, Corny, but I like it. (laughs) You know, so, so what I would do is I'd give the senior resident this book to hold for the rotation and to pick a joke. And then if she or he did not like what was in the book, they then had to go and find a joke of their own. And we started off rounds every day with a joke to sort of understand that humility is the key to taking care of patients. That's a good way to start off any day with a, a joke and bring some more uh, humanity to the day that might get kind of tough after that. So a little bit more about you. I was looking into the Michigan Free Market Medical Association a little bit. Could you explain a little bit more about that and and what it's about real quick? Well, sure. This is a chapter of a national organization, Free Medical Care, founded by Keith Smith. So you may ask, well, who is Keith Smith? Keith Smith is the founder of the Surgical Clinic of Oklahoma in uh, Oklahoma City. And what he did starting about 15 years ago, he and a general surgeon hawked everything they owned and bought a building and converted it into a surgical clinic. So far, it's not that unusual. But what they did do is they only take cash. So they said they could lower their prices without going through third parties. And actually, when he opened his prices, were one-tenth that of the local hospital, sometimes more than one-tenth. He also posted on his website every procedure they do and their price. So it was a great gamble, and it has been wildly successful. Wow. I like the price transparency there. And it sounds similar to some of the other interviews I've done in uh, direct primary care. Is that a similar type of mentality? That's right, actually. And, And he's a great supporter of direct primary care. And what he and the rest of us believe that most transactions should be via cash and that people should have a much more robust health savings account and they should be able to pay cash for most things, and return insurance to what insurance really is, and that is for a catastrophic, unexpected event. Yeah, could you imagine a system that actually worked like that? (laughs) Well, there have been experiments. There was one in uh, Indiana, started by the governor at that time, uh, Mitch Daniels, and the person he put in charge was uh, Seema Verma, who you may know is the head of uh, CMS in this administration. And they decided they would do a cigarette tax and they would take that money and allow, I believe it's 40,000 people on Medicaid to enter this program. They gave every Medicaid patient $1,200 cash into an account that they could only spend for healthcare and a catastrophic health insurance policy. And this went on for a number of years. 
And it was wildly successful because for the first time now, people without means could pay cash to see a doctor. So they didn't have to go to the emergency room. Emergency room visits went way down about by, I believe, in half. And to get the next year's payment into their account, they had to get some uh, necessary screening tests, a physical exam, some simple blood work, diabetes checkup, blood pressure, et cetera. It was wildly successful. However, (laughs) it was stopped by the uh, Obama administration, who believed that it had to be a government-centered program and not an individual scented program. Wow. Okay. I was not aware of that. It seems like any program that gets the emergency room, you know, only half capacity would be a pretty useful. Well, sure. Because you have to understand that Medicaid pays physicians so poorly that most will not take a new case so that the people have no other resort but to go to the emergency room. Plus, there's a habit set up to go to the emergency room. And when the state of Massachusetts instituted a a government-based Medicaid program for everyone, and they predicted, oh, we'll pay for this by emergency room visits going down, the opposite happened. Emergency room visits went up because you have to supply the funds by which people can seek the care that's best for them. That makes sense. All right. So, I do want to get a little bit into your past clinical experiences to help sort of guide the medical students that might be listening to this before the rotations or if they're, for instance, not able to get a nephrology rotation and never get to see exactly what what it entails to have that. So one of the questions I had, I'm guessing as a nephrologist, you probably didn't have a community setting. It was uh, strictly a university or hospital system. Yes. Um, actually, every job I had was a hospital-based university system. Okay. Um, so I, my, my first job was at the uh, University of Chicago, and it kept on going around Chicago for a while. And then I ended up here in Kalamazoo and ran an internal medicine program here in this town. And then I left that, that for five years at Henry Ford to run the fellowship program. Okay. Yeah, I suppose as nephrologists and a lot of uh, specializations in internal medicine, it would be somewhat difficult to do in a more community setting, in a private practice setting? Well, not really. Well, here, here in Kalamazoo, there, there is a private nephrology group, and I think it consists probably now of five, six doctors. But do they work through a hospital? Well, they cover hospital patients, uh, referrals. They have a, a, a dialysis unit or two. So there are really many nephrologists that work in the community setting. I see. All right. So sometimes these terminology and different settings can get confusing for students. I know when I did a pathology rotation, uh, because it was in a hospital system, I assumed that they were working for the hospital initially, and then it was clarified later that they're actually private practice technically, and they're independent that get hired by the hospital. So I guess all these different uh, formalities are a little confusing sometimes. (laughs) Well, that's quite true. I don't know if you want to talk about this now or later on, that, you know, right now we're in a hospital employed or or employed doctor Mm -hmm. uh, situation, whereas 10 years ago, probably 75% of doctors owned their own practice or worked in a doctor group that owned the practice. Now it's much, it's probably around 40%. Uh, and you know, there's a big talk about burnout and this, that, and the other thing. So one of the things I, I want, I would like to discuss would be for your students to think about, do they wish to be an employee or do they wish to run their own practice and determine how much time they spend with patients, et cetera. And I think it's a very important choice. It is. I think you just beat me to like the last question I usually ask. <laughs> what okay. advice do you have for right. I'm sorry. <laughs> No, that's perfectly fine. Yeah, let's uh, come back to the details of that at the end then, because I think a lot of students are going to need to prepare for that eventuality. So having some insights and understanding the differences and how the whole medical environment has changed in the past few years is very valuable. I'll be glad to discuss it. (laughs) Great. So uh, for preceptors that are uh, nephrology preceptors in particular, since having a specialization is something that not every student is going to have experience in. And 
And what is it, do you think, makes a good preceptor or some positive skills that they should display in order to effectively teach students? Sure. Well, I, I think there are some general ideas and general concepts. Uh, you may recall I ran an internal medicine program also. So there are a few key points, I believe. And I think I mailed some of them to you. Did. The key thing is, can you teach this young person? It's very interesting that many young students in medicine are, I guess, insecure, and they deal with that insecurity by being haughty, <laughs> which is truly annoying. So I think the key thing that a student has to learn at any rotation is to be a learner, an aggressive learner, and ask questions as to why the preceptor has decided that this is the way to treat this patient under this circumstance. What is the thinking involved? And to usually pick an interesting case and read in depth about that for a day or two or three, and then discuss your thinking, the student's thinking about how they understand the pathophysiology, the impact of that disease on that particular patient, why that patient reacted the way they did, those kinds of things. But the key is to be an active learner and to be enthusiastic, but not obnoxious. So that's my little speech. And you'll be amazed how difficult it is sometimes for learners to strip away their anxiety and just listen and think about what's going on and why the preceptor is saying the things they're saying and asking and asking about, well, what's the idea behind what you're saying? What is the thinking? What are the steps you went through to get to this conclusion? Because what you're trying to do is accumulate information and to understand the pathophysiology of the problems that people have. And there is no one answer. There's never a single answer. There are many ways to approach a situation. I like that. Yeah, so a preceptor definitely needs to assess the, the thinking patterns and the level of knowledge of their students to really know what the next step is in their training. Right, and to encourage the student to be an active learner. Got it. And to me, it's really thrilling to be able to discuss the pathophysiology of what's going on. The next question is, are there any unsafe practices in your specialty to beware for preceptors? Always. There's always the potential for an unsafe practice. What is the proper dose of a drug in somebody whose kidney function is uh, subpar or non-existent is a very important point. Many times patients receive a dose that's inappropriate for their kidney function. You can make the wrong diagnosis. I mean, you know, to understand internal medicine, most of difficult cases is figuring out what tissue to biopsy and send to the pathologist for them to tell you what the disease process is and how are you going to go about that. And of course, you don't have to CAT scan and get an MRI and everybody walks through the door. Mm -hmm. Think. You have, to, you have to take a good history. You have to be able to do an excellent physical exam. And that's something we wanted to, that we should spend some time on. Because right now, students and the preceptor are busy at a computer putting in information that may be pertinent or may be not pertinent. But that cuts down the interaction time. And it cuts down the learning time. So today, in my opinion, students have a much harder time than in my day because we didn't have those time constraints. So now students have to realize if they're going to really pursue excellence, they're going to have to go above and beyond what we had to go through because they don't have the time so that they're going to have to devote more time to the issue instead of less and that the computer in many instances, is an impediment that they have to overcome. So it's much more difficult for students today. And I believe they should be aware of these processes 
Yeah, I could see that things are infinitely more complex. And, and it sounds like one of the things as a preceptor to really look out for there is just to monitor your students, make sure their their diagnosis, their dosaging, anything like that, that they are attributing to a patient that you really want to monitor, make sure everything's accurate. There's a lot of potential for serious side effects when you're dealing with someone probably with kidney damage at that point. Right. But also keep in mind, and I've spoken to a number of doctors about this, that they're so busy putting in clicks uh, in the computer that sometimes their ability, the preceptor's ability to interact with the student is compromised. So again, the student has to realize this. And then when everybody is putting their information in the computer, to spend three, four, five minutes just chatting about what has just occurred. That brings up an interesting question on that topic is, okay, so let's assume medical students are the first ones to go and do certain tasks or enter certain information. Then generally it would, the resident would be the next step in the line in the pecking order. So they would have to check it. And then ultimately the attending given time would have to check it again. (laughs) Right. Exactly. Exactly. So it's a real problem. The computer programs that we're using now were just forced on the profession. There was no, I mean, there was no testing of these programs, whether they help doctors take care of patients or impede their ability to take care of patients. And now people are dealing with, quote, burnout and things like of that nature. And the EHR is usually quoted as the first problem because these are not doctor-friendly programs. Yeah, definitely. But people have to use them because they won't get paid if they use something else, except if you're like Keith Smith and you only take cash, then you can use programs that are wonderful to use. So again, this is something that people have to think about. Uh, It's good to see that there are more options being available to to help help future physicians and current physicians out so that can tackle this potential burnout issue, crisis, whatever uh, they're calling it. All right. That's really interesting information there. I want to know if there's any, maybe one thing that stuck out to you as a, a learning experience when you were training, whether it be through your education or as an educator, one really good learning experience that stands out. I mean, for me, what I found most enjoyable was a interaction with a student, a resident, a fellow who was really thinking hard about the problem at hand and really went into depth and asked very important questions. And then, of course, as a precept, you say, well, wait a second, that's a really good idea. I have to think about that for a minute. Now, that would be the highlight of the day. <laughs> okay. You know, you're thinking about something that was really insightful. That would be very exciting. I wonder how often that happened. It's actually not that rare. Oh, good. I mean, if you want to create that kind of environment, in other words, you, I think it's up to the preceptor to encourage that kind of environment. There are impediments to that. One could be the insecurity of the preceptor. I mean, that's possible. Another one could be, again, this EHR time issue, which you have to get over. But actually, there are a lot of really bright young people out there, and sometimes they ask really good questions. And that's exhilarating. You say, oh, wow, that's fantastic. I think setting up the perfect learning environment perfectly segues into one of the uh, main models that we're trying to use for this podcast, and that's the one-minute preceptor model. So would you mind if we go over that model real quick and you can give examples of how to use it? Fine. So five steps, and the first step is to get a commitment from the student. So how would you recommend going about getting a commitment from a student in your academic environment? Well, I would ask the student if they really want to learn. I mean, are they open to new ideas? Are they open to trying to delve into pathophysiology? Are they open to delve in what maybe should have been done and not what was done? Are they willing to ask themselves serious questions? And are they willing to understand that this is a very difficult profession, that you're not going to be right all the time? There's no such thing. You're a person and people make mistakes, but you have to make sure. And and one of the benefits of being in a teaching situation is as you talk out what you're going to do with a particular case, you know, all of a sudden it dawns on you as you're speaking, wait a second, that doesn't make sense. 
let's stop and think for a minute. So one of the keys is to discuss what your thinking is with other people. And as you're bringing out your ideas, it dawns on you. you I mean, they don't have to say anything. It dawns on you that, oh, wait a second, that doesn't make any sense. Let, I mean, let's go back a step or two. In a really good teaching situation, there should be many fewer mistakes than for a person in a solo practice, in my opinion. So then uh, getting the commitment from the student as far as like a diagnosis or a treatment, sounds like they sort of come with, to you with an initial assessment and then you get into their mind, you clarify certain bits and pieces sure. and goes into the second part, which is probing for supporting evidence. So it sounds like you're kind of doing that there by trying to get into their mind and understand their thought process for the diagnosis. Exactly. And also, you know, uh, perhaps they took a, a few minutes to go to uh, up to date or some other reference source to get a sort of background. I mean, one has to understand as a preceptor, this may be the first time a, a student or a resident has ever seen this problem. And so it always pays to sort of go quickly and, and read a little bit about it and have a sense of uh, what's going on or even looking at the symptom. What could cause this? What's a decent differential diagnosis? And how would you pursue it? What tests would you pursue uh, without breaking the bank, which is uh, very common yeah. and unnecessary? All right. Then for the next part is uh, step three is reinforcing what was done well. If a student has successfully diagnosed or treated or come to a logical conclusion, or any process involved to really reinforce their knowledge or reinforce that they took the correct mental steps? Ah, well, that, that's the most fun because then you assign the student to read two or three papers and come back the next day and talk about the pathophysiology or, or the effect that this disease is having on this particular patient. Because there's an old adage, one third of presentations are pure disease one third is a combination of the disease and the person's personality and background. And one third is just make believe. So where is this person coming from? And every individual is different. And that's what makes it even more fascinating. So that two people with the exact same disease process can present in quite different ways. And so what, you, what experience does for you it broadens your understanding of how various problems can uh, present so that you broaden your idea of how a disease can manifest itself in different people. Got it. From there, the next step, step four, is sort of the opposite. Instead of reinforcing what they've done well, it's giving guidance for errors or omission. How do you go about assessing proper way to say, mm, you kind of need to fix that? Um, you, you didn't quite get that right. I had to guide them in that process. Sure. Well, I think that involves being patient and understanding that it's a very complex business medicine. And so, you know, I would say something like, well, you may want to rethink this particular point and I'll give you my thinking about it. And then why don't you take this point and read about it and let's talk about it tomorrow some more to see if you have a different viewpoint. Perfect. Yeah, I think that's very beneficial and good advice, uh, and especially these days with all of the digital resources that a lot of students have. A lot of times uh, I find that they'll just go and read it real quick in the broom closet or something and then come back like, okay, I read up to date or I read this journal article and it's a uh, sure. much faster process than it probably was in the past. Oh, no question. <laughs> but there is a problem with that. And the problem is you have to think about it <laughs> for a few minutes. Um, yeah, it's instant information, but is it wisdom? So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you have to say, well, what's the implications of this and what does it mean? And another issue we all have is what's the source of the information? Was this study paid for by an insurance company? Well, <laughs> then you know the result is going to be. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, or was it paid for by a drug company? Uh, I have friends at the University of Chicago who refuse to read papers paid for by insurance or drug company. Isn't that the majority of papers? <laughs> Unfortunately. Uh, yeah. So that... Um, they have the money. 
That's right. And, and of course, the people who design these studies for large entities are very sophisticated. And it's very hard for us doctors to really understand how they twisted <laughs> the statistics to reach the conclusion that they say, which is in their interest. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. You have to have sort of a skepticism also about what you're reading. And is it is it actual fact? And of course, science builds on itself. You know, there's not one paper that explains the world. You know, everything is a little step forward, another little step, another little step. And it's an infinite process. I mean, we will never know everything about everything. I mean, it's just is not going to happen. Yeah. You have to understand where a paper fits in the big scheme of things. And and that takes a lot of experience. Even though every student has to take biostats, no one says that's their favorite course or even really has a firm grasp of it when they're done. So I completely understand these papers are way above most of our heads to try to poke holes through. We just have to read them and sort of sure. go by guidelines at that point. And you get good at it after a while, but you'll never be as good as the uh, $200,000 paid statistician who is designing the study for the drug company to get the result they want. Yep, exactly. And you mentioned something when we were talking about step four, about giving the student basically a reading assignment and then coming back and discussing it afterwards. And that actually leads perfectly to step five, which is teaching a general principle. So I assume at that point, once they've read the material, they come back to you, you can discuss it, then that would be discussing the general principle with them, correct? Right, exactly. Then getting into some of the student aspects, I know we already kind of discussed uh, when a student starts, what you're looking for is really to be an aggressive learner, be, a, be enthusiastic, but not obnoxious. Are there any best practices that a student should look for before beginning a nephrology rotation or maybe any recommended uh, materials or resources before preparing for it? I think that's an excellent question. Nephrology is um, a lot of pathophysiology. So it probably would behoove a student who's going to do a nephrology elective to freshen up on physiology, normal physiology of the kidney. And of course, recently, in the past 10, 15 years, there's been an explosion of knowledge on protein carriers on the cell and what affects these carriers, and et cetera. And then also probably for a nephrology elective, you, you want to think about examining the urine because, um, you know, we, we have this saying, a, a liquid biopsy. And you can determine a lot of what's going on by examining the urine. You can examine the urine for, for cells and pathology, but you can also examine the urine for electrolytes and sodium, potassium, pH, all kinds of issues. So that would probably help to have a little background of that before you start. It's just a, a little sketch of knowledge. Just review that. Just read a little bit about that. I know in our nephrology elective, we always collected urines on every patient and then went back to the lab and examined the urine carefully with special stains. And it was, it was very enjoyable. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, everyone thinks about the electrolytes and maybe microbes, but they don't really think about cytopathology and other things that can be done to it as well. Right. You can really learn a lot by looking at the urine. And again, it appears as if students have less time for this. So you have to kind of say, wait a second, let's collect some urine. Let's go to the lab and look at it. And it's very beneficial. You'd be amazed how much you can learn from looking at the urine. Probably. That sounds like a really interesting experience that unfortunately a lot of students are not going to be able to uh, receive unless they get into some sort of uh, really thorough IM elective or possibly after IM residency. But I'm sure there's a lot of interesting things that can be done with that source of tests. Sure. There are a lot of things you can figure out by looking at the electrolytes and the, the common tests that we do and look at the urine sometimes you you don't need an MRI on everybody. Saves a lot of time and money. Sure does. But again, look what happens if you haven't got the time. And that's what's going on. Less time to think about it, less time to really examine the simple stuff. So again, you're insecure. So you order everything in the book. It's not uncommon. And then again, I would tell students, 
work on your physical exams. You know, if, you, if you're around a residency program that has a lot of international graduates, they will tell you that their physical exam skills were better when they started than when they finished. Really? Because in other countries, put a great deal of emphasis on physical exam, where that's waning here in the United States. Very interesting. Yeah, I guess I wouldn't have thought of that. <laughs> well, it's, again, a time issue. And it's, it, again, I sort of remember an, an incident that was called to see a surgical patient. It was a few years ago now. And um, I was listening to the lungs and did E to A changes and say 99 and those kind of things. And the surgeon came by and said, I haven't seen anybody do that in years. <laughs> okay. So what we have is a little thing is in your physical exam, you would on a three by five card predict what the x-ray would show. And of course, the first 10 times you, <laughs> you were way off. But then after a while, you get good at it. These are little things that you can do that really help taking care of patients. And also, the patients respect you more for it. Because what they think a doctor does is put their hands on you and, and do all kinds of crazy things. You know, I often tell students and residents that doctors put their hands in things where if you weren't a doctor, you'd end up in jail. And, and the patients expect that. Yeah, I think patient satisfaction surveys show like a huge increase if the doctor just touches a patient once versus a doctor that never touches. And know. does E to A changes and listens carefully to the heart. I can't tell you at morning report how many times Two weeks later, somebody in an ultrasound found a lesion in the heart, which was there on physical exam, but was missed. Wow. These are things I think students should, have, should keep in mind, that the environment is not conducive to honing these skills, when it should be just the opposite, right? The environment should be conducive to honing these skills. Now, this might differ greatly because nephrology is being more specialized and each preceptor and attending in it might have different recommendations. But let's say a student wanted a letter of recommendation from their preceptor in nephrology, such as if they were to come to you in the past or maybe any of your sure. uh, colleagues, what would be a good way to approach that? Do you want to ask ahead of time? Do you want to show initiative first? What are some good practices, bad practices? Well, I think that, again, how you performed, what were the depth of your questions, uh, how receptive were you to learning. If a student has excelled at that, then, of course, ask for a recommendation. I mean, sure, you, you'd love to do it. Awesome. On the other hand, <laughs> if you wanted to float by and it was a month you had to, you know, you had to do, but you didn't want to do it, and then and you didn't ask it, and you weren't really involved, and you didn't want to learn the pathophysiology of disease, and it just wasn't important to you, you know, then I probably wouldn't ask for a recommendation. And, and the students know, right? I mean, I mean, you know how involved you've been and how much you learned. If you've been a really good learner, then by all means. In the past, a lot of resources that I read or heard always said to tell your preceptor beforehand that you're looking for a letter of recommendation. So they are aware of your goal and can assess you that way. But it sounds like mostly interviews I've done so far, that is not really applicable. It's more your performance on the job. The giving initial notification that they're looking for a letter of recommendation hasn't played a part at all. I would say that's true. I, I've never had anybody at, you know, tell me, because it's been years, but I'm in a, and I was always in an educational setting. I probably mentored rotations for students in the thousands. I don't think I've ever been told, well, I may ask you for a recommendation. <laughs> I, I would have said, well, I, well, I mean, your recommendation depends on you. I mean, not on me. It depends on you. Good point. Okay. Good to know. I'm sure a lot of the audience, if they're looking to go into a nephrology rotation, can benefit from this knowledge. And Well, well I would say any rotation. Yeah. Performance is just much, a, a much higher marker than anything else you can do. Exactly. And, and how much you care, you know, how much you care about people, 
you know, how much you uh, have empathy for people, why you went into this in the first place, you know, personality characteristics, along with intellectual, you know, pursuit. Perfect. So this is a section of a personal question. You can choose either one or both if you feel rambunctious, but Go ahead. the first question is, is there anything you would have done differently in your career or education? Oh, that's, that's really a wonderful question. And the second one, if you want to choose between them, is if there's one dream you would like to see happen in medicine in your lifetime, what would it be? Well, uh, let me answer both questions at the same time. Okay, perfect. <laughs> what I write about and why I'm still active in this and how we got together is I am very disturbed by what is happening in medicine. The 10-minute visit the dissociation between the patient and the doctor. The doctor is just another cog in the, in the wheel. I write, and I, I believe I wrote this in this piece that, that was in the Detroit News. It was in the Detroit News on purpose. It was published on Sunday because the Democratic primary TV uh, shows were going to be on, on Monday and Tuesday. So it was in the paper on Sunday, and I was hoping the, the questioners would read it, uh, but of course they didn't. But one of the, the key phrase is the interaction between a physician and a patient should be intense and intimate. That sounds kind of scary. <laughs> Doesn't it? But it should be. Of course, in today's world, that the possibility of that is less and less. What's happening is as we get more developed third-party medicine who are much more interested in productivity, bottom line, those kinds of issues, the EHR, uh, maximum payment, et cetera, et cetera, this intimate experience is being compromised. So you want to ask yourself, would a situation, if we had more of a, quote, old-fashioned relationship between patients and doctors? Would, would there be so many obese people? You know, would there be so many drug abusers? Would there be so many alcoholics? The price society is paying for this mass production is huge. And I believe that has something to do with, quote, burnout, where physicians, you know, most people go into medicine they're very compassionate people, or else they wouldn't do it. And then you, you study your brains out <laughs> and have to be exposed to crazy people like me and learn and learn and learn. And then you're put in a situation where it's mechanistic, where people are just interested in turnover. I mean, you know, five-minute patient visits, seven-minute. I know primary care doctors are seeing sometimes 50 patients a day. Well, that, it's impossible. You cannot connect with people that way. So that's what I write about. That answers both, doesn't it? Because as I was in this career in an academic setting, I was unaware of the forces at work that were greatly hampering what I think should be a proper role for the physician and the patient. And I regret that. And that's why at almost 80, I'm still working at it and writing about it to try to tell people you're going down the wrong path. And the thing that is most disappointing about this is the more mechanistic it becomes, the more expensive it gets. So the very thing that these people are trying to do is control costs, it is exacerbating costs. The more you interfere in this relationship, the more expensive medicine is going to be. Got it. So human meat machine you would have liked to change that sooner and still working towards it today. Right. That's exactly right, Chase. One of the reasons I'm doing this interview is to try to help people understand that they have choices. They don't have to, you know, get into this meat market mess. You can, you can do what Keith Smith did. You can do direct care. You can accept cash for most things. These are things, that the, but, but you have to think about this as an alternative. And it's harder in the beginning, isn't it? Instead of being put into a situation at a large corporation or in a big hospital system or something where somebody just 
you know, gives you the practice. And by day one, you're making an in, the income that they sign you for, but you pay a big price. Certainly do. You pay a very big price for that. If 60% of youngsters leaving residency chose not to be involved in this third party meat market, it would have to change, wouldn't it? Has to change with the market. Because we control everything that happens to patients. So it's us being shepherded down these pathways are letting it happen. That's sort of a, an enlightening <laughs> and depressing philosophy at the same time. <laughs> well, it doesn't have to be depressing. It doesn't have to be that this is what's going on. Again, people, I think it's very hard for people to recognize the, the super factors that are acting on them. They're, they're hard to recognize. And don't forget, people train in large medical centers where practically everybody's on salary, right? And I can tell you in large medical centers during my career, the amount of time that you had to concentrate on these issues has, has decreased dramatically, but yet it continues. So yes, we can change this, but you have to realize what's going on. Yeah, I like that message. <laughs> Be the change you want to see. Right. Perfect. Do you have any parting thoughts for students looking into this type of specialty or? Well, it's, it's very interesting. Nephrology has gone through a lot of changes. When I first was in medical school and attracted to nephrology, nephrology was primarily an inpatient career where you were referred the toughest patients and you were supposed to figure out what's going on, what's the pathophysiology, and how to fix it. So then along came dialysis, and that changed what uh, many nephrologists do, and that is take care of people with chronic renal failure end-stage renal disease, dialysis. And that's a very difficult population to work with. I mean, you can make a lot of money doing it, but it, it can be very difficult. So nephrology right now is having a difficult time recruiting fellows. But if you want to think about pathophysiology, mechanisms of disease, then it's a spectacular way to, to develop your career. Again, you have to be aware of the forces at work what you have to do to be a successful nephrologist. Most join a private nephrology group and they develop dialysis units here, there, and everywhere, and primarily do in-hospital consultations. And then somebody with end-stage renal disease, they send to their own dialysis unit. Very interesting. Okay. But basically, if you want to understand renal disease, it's, it's very enjoyable. Biopsies, the pathology of the different disease. And the progress that's being made now is just unbelievable as for the genetics, the carriers that are involved on cell surfaces, the interaction of different intracellular signals. If you're interested in that, then it's fascinating. And let's say for a nephrology resident or even fellow or attending that wanted to maybe get into precepting, are there particular steps that you'd recommend if they're looking to get into that type of academic or educational setting? Sure. Well, usually um, working with students, you have to be in a place that has students. <laughs> and places that have students are usually either a university hospital or an affiliated hospital because those are where the students are. So uh, if you want to teach, which I did throughout my career, you have to be affiliated with some kind of university setting because that's where the students are, a medical school setting or an affiliate. So that's an interesting point. I kind of want to push back a little bit on because the growing number of international students that don't have an associated medical hospital, you know, medical university hospital setting, they need more private practice individuals and preceptors to, to gain access to that type of specialized education. So I would think that those already in an academic setting are probably well-versed in this, but those outside of an academic setting that wanted to get involved, that would be an interesting discussion to have. Yes. I see what you're saying. I think it depends whether you're talking about students, because international graduates are not students anymore. I mean, they're, they're looking for a residency, right? So, so if you're talking about students, students are medical school business. 
if you're looking at international graduates. No, no, international medical students, not international graduates. So they're still medical students and they still have to do their rotations in the oh. US. Oh, I see. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have no knowledge or experience. Okay. With that. Fair enough. I never had any activity. Okay. All right. Um, we have covered a lot of material here. Yeah. I know some of the resources you were saying, just study up on your pathophysiology. And since those resources are usually shifting so quickly, I don't know if you would have one or two resources you'd recommend today for students or if they should just look up. Well, I find up to date very useful. Okay. So if you're going to start, if you let's see next week, you're going to start a nephrology rotation as a student then I would you know, look up urine analysis on up-to-date. You, you don't have to spend hours and hours and look up you know, some pathophysiology, HLA and, and tissue typing, a few broad areas to get kind of in the flow of things. Perfect. If uh, anyone wants to reach out to you personally, where can they find you? They can send me an email or get to see me on LinkedIn. I think we met on LinkedIn. Correct. So I'm sort of open for anybody who wants to connect. Okay. So finding Dr. Kenneth Fisher on LinkedIn and also your email, I believe, is on your page. So it's easy to reach out to that's you. Right. And I'll put links in the show notes too, just for anyone that's interested. Sure. Absolutely. Be a pleasure. And your books are also on your LinkedIn page. And is there any other place that they could look for those? Well, they're all over. They're on Amazon. They're on Barnes & Noble websites. Uh, if you do Kenneth A. Fisher, MD, or Understanding Healthcare, it'll pop right up on Amazon. It's both electronic and paperback. Uh, it's all there. I can tell you, as an amateur author, you don't make money <laughs> writing books unless you're uh, Hillary Clinton or Michelle Obama. <laughs> Yeah, they have someone write it for them anyway. It doesn't count. <laughs> right. right. I know my first medical base book is uh, about to come out soon. It's for study skills for medical students. So I'm there with you. <laughs> right. <laughs> it it's a lot of work. Uh, it's enjoyable, but it's not going to make you rich. Yeah, definitely. Well, Dr. Kenneth Fisher, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Well, Chase, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. 